This is Martial Arts Explorer, exploring practical technique as found in classical martial arts of all styles. I'm Scott Combs. Let's start today with a few kata maxims. You can think of a maxim as an expression of a general truth or principle. Here are a few we use in our training. Kata is not free fighting. The fighting in kata happens at grabbing distance. Technique is not determined by kata. It is determined by circumstance. As circumstances change, Technique must also. This next one is adapted from Occam's Razor. All things being equal, the simplest interpretation of kata will probably be the correct one for use in self-defense. Kata remains the same, regardless of variations. Kata interpretations change constantly, with new understanding and insight. Performing kata by yourself is only half the exercise. The other half is performing the interpretation with a partner. If you have any maxims you use in your training, we'd love to know about them. Send your email to explorer at martialartsexplorer.tv. This time, Master Thomas continues his exploration of pressure point basics. I, what I want to do is I want to, uh, uh, very important, so we've, we've had these principles that we've talked about, which is, some points you rub, some points you hit. The third one is some points you touch. So we need to cover some points you touch. Rick, I guess, can I bury you? So we'll just do a quick uh, touch point. Very useful touch point. It's located, see this is the bone of the wrist. It's, it's called um, heart six. And the Chinese name is something like Z Z cleft point or something. And then the one next to it, heart I think heart seven is called the gateway to the heart, so right side by side. What I do is I look for the bump on the radial bone, which is called the, uh, the styloid process of the radius. I go right behind the bump, there's a little soft divot. I like to go across that point. That, see, that helps me find it. Reach around the bone, and then I go like I'm trying to hook up underneath the bone. And what this point does is this point causes the wrist to bend, okay? So that means that if he makes a fist and I try to bend his fist, very difficult for me to do. If I reach across and catch that point, very easy for me to do. If I reach across, it's very easy for me to bend it if I touch that point. Now, sometimes people hear touch and they go, oh, touch, <laughs> okay? So I'm gonna turn this like this, I watch it. This is, I do not mean this when I say touch, I mean that. Do you see me go, touch! <laughs> Dig your finger in there. Reach in, now, sometimes, depends on the person. So I'm gonna show you two ways to activate this point and then you do the one that works for you. So I use the tip of my finger and I go, very, very easy because I, for that. But maybe you can't, maybe your fingers are, uh, short and stubby, maybe they're not, maybe you don't have a strong grip. What you can use is this bone here on your fist and you actually just come this way. And so where I have come across, reached across and hooked back, what you do is you rub across here and then use the bone to hook back, okay? So it's very, very simple. Now, that means if somebody grabs me, again, this is not a self-defense response, this is a demonstration technique to practice the principle because if you get grabbed like this I'm not gonna do what we're gonna practice because that's just I mean I got a whole nother problem there I'm what I would probably do is something more like okay <laughs> right so what I did so you understand here's the the theory behind this he grabs me and that's the threat so physically I want to move out of the way of the threat I want to control this hand, so I'll just do this very slight motion and pin it to my chest. That gets, that's taking care of that hand. And as long as I'm walking that way, I might as well take a leg. And now I can do my technique. But the first thing I do is make sure that I'm not going to get hit. So this is not a self-defense technique. This is, a, this is what I call a training technique or a presentation technique. Let's do this side so we can see. Either reach over, hook with a finger, or reach under, hook with a thumb. If you hook with, if you hook with a finger, it ends up in your grip. If you hook with a thumb, you have to pull it to your body. And then if you want to get it in your grip, you have to do this. And that works fine. And I would say try them both and practice them both. This is pressure point 101 stuff. 
Now, what we've talked about is we started out with the biomechanical principles, which was you bend your elbow, you're working in your own strength. And then we talked about the fact that pressure points are related to each other. And I started by showing you the back hand, the, the unobvious hand, because everyone thinks about the hitting hand. We did the unobvious hand. So we actually, even though we're talking very basic here, we talked about it in its full context. Multiple pressure points that are related to each other to get a greater effect combined with biomechanical principles, which also work to create the same effect. We pile all that stuff together. Now what we've done in the process of doing that, though, we showed that there were rub points and hit points. And then I backed away and I did, here's a touch point. So again, I'm keeping now at a very, very basic angle and direction is the, the language for just means you got to hit it the right way. So a pressure point responds effectively if it is hit the right way. And if it's not hit the right way, it doesn't work very good. So I need a body. And I guess it's going to be Travis. Can you roll your sleeve up? So there's a pressure point. It's basically along the ulna bone, and it's roughly in the middle. Uh, more or less, what happens is in the middle of the bone. In the middle of a bone, you get, uh, especially on the forearm, you have two things going on on the forearm. But first thing you have in the middle of a bone is you have this nerve called the fusiform fiber. It's a, it's a bit of neurology that monitors the bone and tells the body if the bone is in danger of breaking. And then the other thing you tend to have in the forearm is you've got all these muscles in the forearm. You've got the flexor, the flexor muscles. And then the muscle is up here. So when you bend your fingers, the muscle bending your finger is way up here. And then there's this long cable that goes all the way through your wrist and up and works its way around. So you're not actually, you know, finger strength is not actually in the fingers. It's actually way down here in the forearm. Because the muscle is here, and then you have this long tendon, there's a place where muscle fiber and tendon fiber intersect. And any place that happens, that's a weaker point in the body. Tendons don't tend to break in the middle. They tend to pull away from the muscle. So do you understand that? It's where you get the transition of tissue. So right in the middle of the tendon is very strong. But where the tendon attaches to the muscle, that's where it tends to be weak. As a result, the body has to put a monitor there to see if the tendon is tearing. And that's what's called a body of Golgi's. So basically, in the middle of the forearm, you tend to have both of these structures. You tend to have, because you're in the middle of a bone, you tend to have a fusiform fiber. Because you're at a place where a muscle is ending and it's connecting to a tendon, you tend to have a, a body of Golgi. So you have these nerve receptors that are going to be responding to this. So right along this, along the ulna, uh, it's basically where the, the uh, what's this, the uh, ulnaris. brevis ulnaris. OK, thank you. So it's roughly where the brevis ulnaris ends, roughly in the middle of the bone. It's nice to have doctors in the house, because <laughs> I can just ask. <laughs> All right? And this is a point that lies along the heart meridian, but it's not a heart meridian point. So it's an, what we call an extraordinary point. Now, it's still. We kind of treat it like a heart meridian point, but it's technically it's not. It, it's not part of the primary heart meridian system. This is used as a release. It causes the hand to open, but it does it in a, a lot of times points that cause the hand to open, the hand opens after first flexing. So the hand goes dunk dunk like this. This one just kind of opens the hand. And angle and direction on it is really critical. If he grabs me, the angle and direction of this point is actually about 45 degrees up. See, it goes this, this way. And then the way you get it is you kind of hold your arm stiff and you go like that. Now you'll notice, here's a wonderful thing about pressure points, is that biomechanically, this is also a weak direction on his wrist. But if he just makes a fist and I simply hold it, see? <laughs> OK? <laughs> and that's all just an angle and direction issue. Notice how I swung my arm really stiff. Just bunk. Now let's say. That's right. I'm now good. let me do it to the other arm. <laughs> Let's say he grabs me, angle and direction. Remember the angle and direction was this direction. And this is a hit point, so you have to hit it. But watch. If I go like this, the first thing we did, that point is now here, and the angle and direction is kind of that way. See? The angle and direction moves with his arm. So now, yeah, you see, so you see this beginning of a joint. You can see the beginning of a joint lock here. But what I can do with this is I can simply do did you see that flex of the hand, that oh, release? So I can be here and just hit it. <laughs> OK? <laughs> so I can be here and hit it this way. 
up, the, but then I'm hitting it towards myself. I hit it here, bang, it's towards him. And what's cool about this is that after you hit it here, see how this hand is now let go? So you can actually shoot straight forward. So you go hit, hit, and boom, boom. That, of course, that does not look like a move in any karate system at all. I have never seen a karate system do a technique like that. No karate people go like that. No one does. That's, that's just crazy. I mean, to think that anyone in karate would do something like that. <laughs> we refer to this point, conveniently, we call it the disarm point, because it's much easier to say than MUE 20, is it 24 or 28? Yeah, see, I can't even remember, right? <laughs> MUE 28, I mean, it's, and then the Chinese name is worse. So, disarm point, but this is where it is. And I'd like you to try, try both ways, so you can just see where it is, and you're looking, angle and direction is what we're looking at, how to hit a point the correct way. So now, we just talked about angle and direction, we talked about some points you hit, some points you this, that, and the other thing. Now what I want you to know is that occasionally, you can mess with a point and get, get a kind of different result depending on how you angle it and how you attack it. Now, not all points do this, but as you learn points, you discover that some points you can, you can rub and hit. But the angle, it changes. So if you were to, you have to find this on yourself, so it's a little different for each person, but a shorthand way to do it is you kind of right below your pupils, you go straight down to your jaw, a little bit around the round of your jaw, and then you kind of wiggle around until you find a spot that feels funny. That is what's called the mental foramen, which means that's where the nerve comes out. So there's this nerve traveling from your brain. It travels happily and safely protected from your brain mm -hmm. through the inside of the bone. Nothing can touch it or reach it, and that's where it peeks its head out and looks around. That's what a foramen is. Now, there are all these, I mean, there, you're, you're, because all nerves start in your brain, all nerves have to come out of your skull through a hole in your skull, and there are multiple holes in your skull. You know that expression, I need that like, another, like I need another hole in the head? Well, you've got lots of holes in your head. We just think there are just these few, but if you look at a skull, there's holes everywhere. But there are only six holes that you can reach from the outside. Two here, two here, two here. So it's the mental foramen, the suborbital foramen, and the supraorbital foramen. The body hates it when those nerves get activated. Sometimes it doesn't hurt. I, I, uh, sometimes it depends on the individual, but some people you'll tap on the foramen point and they'll go, man, that didn't hurt. <laughs> but the body is screaming to get away from it because the body understands that's a place where that nerve is incredibly Vulnerable. It's just vulnerable because of location. So we got the foramen, right? If I hit that foramen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it in this direction, see about 45 degrees or so. I, what I'm doing is I'm kind of aiming, if I imagine where his spine is, I aim next to his spine on the other side, and just a little teeny tap, right? <laughs> okay? That's what that does. But you notice that what that does is that it affects that the control that has is that it affects his consciousness. I neurologically put a signal that goes up to his brain, and his brain goes, let's take a minute and... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm back, <laughs> right? To me, a lot of times pressure point techniques, I, I think we're talking like static. The research that was done at, um, in Philadelphia at the U University Hospital in Philadelphia knocked people out, they were all wired up, and they kept going, man, we got all this artifact. They can not always see this artifact, and the wires are moving, and, well, let's try this. And we're, they were trying to get rid of artifact. They never get rid of artifact. I have a theory, and I'm not sure how to, my, my theory is the artifact was the knockout. <laughs> that the, when the energy goes in, or at least some of it was, when the energy goes in, the brain just goes, <laughs> okay, we're back. <laughs> and that, yeah. <laughs> so what you get is that the, I, I suspect that the EEG of a pressure point knockout would look like, Normal brain waves, then normal brain waves. Because the signal goes into the brain, and the brain goes, what, what, what was that? And there's just kind of a momentary freak out, and then it settles down again. It's no big deal. A little bit like your computer sometimes. It just kind of goes, <laughs> and you go, what was that? All right, so if you tap it, you get, whoa. And so 
if you want to tap the pressure point, you're going to tap it on yourself, not somebody else. But if I take that, I notice I went that way. If now I'm going to take, change the angle, I'm going to go this way. And I'm going to take two fingers. I'm going to put my fingers on either side of the point, And I'm going to go like that. See? See what happens? Do you see how his jaw goes and his head goes like this? What that does is it releases his jaw and his cervical spine. That's what I'm doing. So I take that, I go here, that's now all released. And so now it becomes very, very easy to then do a, a head takedown and just bring the guy down. I mean, it's really simple. Because, you know, if he's strong, he grabs me and he's like, and I'm trying to turn his head, that's very hard. But I just do that. See, just that motion releases jaw and neck. And then it's very, very simple for me to take him down. Okay, so I would like you to try that because I want you to see that you, some pressure points are friendly. You can get a slightly different result with a slightly different attack. Remember to be careful if you try these techniques at home. You want to make the technique work, but you don't want to injure your friend, and we aren't responsible for any injuries that may occur. We love hearing from you. Send email to explorer at martialartsexplorer.tv. For Martial Arts Explorer and Michael Kleinapier, I'm Scott Combs.